Hey there, it's Dan Kenner with another episode of The Casual Author. Today is Tuesday, April 4th, 2023, as I record this, and this is episode 71 of the podcast. Today we're talking to Dylan Quarles about his success story with independent publishing. It's great to hear success stories. I mean, we know that there are successful independent authors out there, those of us who have been pursuing indie author objectives for a while and maybe not seen as much success as we hoped it's excellent to see these success stories i love to hear success stories from traditionally published authors as well so hopefully we'll have some more of them in the mix at some point but today i think dylan has a lot of great insight um, and learnings for you i hope you enjoy that conversation before we get into that of course we have the updates so in terms of homestead updates not a lot of updates right now. We're still kind of in that prep phase for the babies to come. This last week, we did vaccinations. So uh, you're supposed to vaccinate your goats every year. Again, there's a, a list of common diseases. Vaccinations are good for them. We have not done it historically, mainly because... We didn't feel like it was necessary. We didn't have a lot of diseases in the area that would be dangerous for our goats. Plus, you know, trying to keep our goats as clean, as healthy as possible. We didn't feel comfortable necessarily putting those chemicals into them at the time. So after doing some more research and knowing that there are more diseases out there this year, things have been kind of wild this year. All of the things that you've heard, including animal diseases. So we did the vaccinations. Uh I generally handle the hard jobs. It wasn't necessarily hard to do them. My wife can is she's completely capable of doing them. She's just like, why? You're here to do them so you can do them. In any case, it was easy. Not too bad. Just watch some YouTube videos about how to do it. It's general. You know, you've got the syringe, you've got the medicine, pretty easy vaccination. So that was fun. The other challenging part is getting the goats on the stand who aren't used to it. If you know anything about goats, they can be obstinate. Sometimes you can get a goat breed that is pretty chill. They're they're really easy to work with. Maybe they grew up with you. You know, you train them pretty well because our goats have been dam raised intentionally. We didn't feel like we had the time to bottle feed all of the babies. We've talked about this before. They are kind of skittish. So we've been have to train them whenever they're about to have babies to come kindly, nicely, without fighting out of their pen into the shop, what we're calling our barn, and up on the stand. So we're working with them starting now so they can get comfortable with it. And it's the same with all goats. So we have two goats that are very comfortable with it. We've done a lot of training with them, and we can just open up the door and say, okay, hop up, and they'll just run up and hop up. The other three, eh, a little iffy. Two of them have never had kids before, so this is their first time. One has had kids before, but she is not the sharpest goat. So there's a long story of why that is the case. She's great. She's a really beautiful looking goat. She's got a great udder, but she's not very smart. So we're <laughs> trying to work with her again. She doesn't run from us as much, which is good. In any case, getting them up on the stand was a fun experience. Uh, some forcing, dragging a little bit, um, but they'll get used to it. It just takes some time. There's a video on that that I'll be putting out this weekend about vaccinating the goats. I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, and you get to see the kittens there as well. We have done better with the kittens this year. So last year, the kittens were very unfriendly. They hid from us. And so we've taken a different approach and it's actually working. We got more regularly, let them climb all over us. And now they love us. They'll they'll hear us coming and they'll start meowing wildly until we come pet them. So that's good. That means by the time when it's time to get rid of them, we won't have to chase them or get a cat trap or anything to grab them. They'll actually come to us so that we can give them away. So that's exciting. The little things you don't think about when you don't have a homestead. Um, other than that, everything is melting. And I talked about that a little bit last week. I'm going to talk about it still, mainly because we still have piles of snow that are four to five, six feet high from having, um, you know, our neighbor came over with his tractor and pushed a lot of our snow because he wanted to. And now we've got, you know, massive piles of snow and they are taking some time to melt, but they're still there. So we anticipate that those will all be melted by the end of next week, minimally, possibly even by the end of this week. It depends on how the weather fluctuates. We got more snow last night so if it keeps snowing then it probably won't melt by the end of the week but that's great exciting to see the snow finally melting it's needed to go it's beginning of april should have been gone already this cold winter has been crazy in terms of author news um pretty 
steady as far as progress goes. I'm still working on the first draft of Dragon Blooded. We are looking at near 40,000 words of that draft. Uh, we did finish, I say we, meaning myself and my co-author, finished the first draft of the first trilogy book, which is great. It was uh, really fun to write, really insightful. It's, it's just fun to write shorter books, for one. It's clocking in about 40,000 words, so it's not a super long book, but I think it'll work out for our needs and for the middle grade audience that we're going for. So we are delving into book two now and looking at potentially editing the first one as soon as possible. So great things, making small bits of progress here and there, no complaints. Uh, and hopefully I can step up my YouTube game. I've been dabbling in some courses for video production and editing because I have no experience with that. So you'll have to let me know if you see my YouTube channels increasing in quality. Um, I believe that is all that I have for updates. So we can go ahead and shift over to the interview portion of the podcast. Hey, Dylan, how are you? Good to be here. Thanks for having me on. Excited to have you. Looking forward to learning about you and what you're all about. Take a, take a look at your books and your experience in publishing. Before we dive into that, how long have you been writing and publishing? Uh, I think my first book, The Ruins of Mars, came out in 2012. Okay. So yeah, it's been it's been a while now. I think I maybe put in my ten thousand hours. I don't know if you prescribe to that. I'm not sure that I do, but I've certainly been doing this for a little while now. I, I do not, um, but I, I know that there's some <laughs> people that do. You kind of reach a point in your writing. I've heard a lot of people say, you know, when you reach a million words, then that's you know a certain wow mile that's point. A, well, okay. okay. I mean, that's a new one for me. So I guess I'm going to have to <laughs> you never heard that uh, find the time to go and plug it in and see how many I'm at. But yeah, I am surprisingly close to it. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> it's and I've only written six books, um, but I, I write really long books. So only only it's six. just uh, I mean, it's I feel like I should have more. <laughs> there, I, I know what you mean. People. I know what you mean. They say build a backlist, build a backlist, right? Once yeah. you have that backlist and getting to yeah. that point's pretty tricky, right? For real. I mean, I'm at five novels myself. Okay. So you, you got one up on me. And they are not uh Uber long. They're like mediumly long, I think, you know, probably average. One I know one of them, the third in the Ruins of Mars series, got a little lengthy there. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I stand by it. Um, but uh yeah, the back catalog thing is real a little bit, yeah. at to least in my experience, to some degree, right? Yeah, I mean, and and then also recognizing that, like, you know, this took me a long time to learn um, that it wasn't like always about the newest thing that I had to offer readers. It was like remembering to carry the other ones as well, the other stories in terms of like marketing and social media and outreach and all that stuff that goes along. Uh, because like, honestly, some of my best selling work is my oldest stuff. You know, mm -hmm. my new novel does okay here and there, but my old novels are the ones that like sell. So yeah, it took me a little while to learn to like, not get so hyper-focused on what's right in front of me. And I'm, you know, feel most represents me as an author or whatever, you know? Well, I've heard that from a lot of people actually that, and that's part of you that, you know, they say using your resources, using your content, particularly mm -hmm. your backlist and remembering those things in marketing. So for you, what does that look like? Is that paid marketing for your old work or is that just like social media content, you know, bringing up the content from your older books regularly? Yeah. How do you reference back to your older work? I mean, your first book is 10 years old now. Yeah, I know. More. And, uh, and I said it in the not too distant future, I, when I wrote it, thinking oh, really? like, this will be fine. And um, we're not there, but we are approaching like the starting point of this science fiction story. And so like, I'm actually starting to think about like, what happens in a few years, like, you know, in like the next 10 years or so when I have to be like, yeah, so I know that like things didn't really shake out this way, but you could still <laughs> kind of have fun with this story, right? Like, because, you know, sci-fi always has that, you know, can, can sometimes have that issue. I mean, 2001 still a classic sci-fi film and as we all know nothing like that ever happened at the year 2001 so you know mm -hmm. people will forgive you but uh to answer your actual question um i do a mixture of paid advertising and social media uh beating the streets pounding the streets whatever you want to call it like i spend a lot of time on tiktok creating content uh because i went to film school so i have always had a passion for and love of 
making visual uh, little films, little whatever. I, I've always loved to do that. Stop motion animation, all that stuff is is fun to me. So like when somebody introduced me to TikTok, I immediately saw like, oh, the potential here to make book videos, book ads kind of. And I saw how other people were doing them. I was like, that's really cool. And you can have a lot of fun with it. Like in in a, in five minutes in the middle of the day, you can make a video about your book, you know, even if it's just like showing the cover in a unique way that's kinetic and interesting and catches somebody. And then you put in the, in the text, you know, whatever it is you need to put to sell your book. So, um, I've been doing a mixture of both now for quite a while, but, um, my older books, the first three books, the ruins of Mars trilogy, um, are weirdly popular with retired men huh. of a certain, you know, of a certain age, men of a certain age, as they say. Um, I think it's kind of because I was like super inspired by Arthur C. Clarke and mentioned him. I already referenced him, so I'll mention him again. But, you know, author of such amazing books as Childhood's End and Rendezvous with Rama and Fountains of Paradise, and blah, blah, blah. I love him. And I loved him a lot, especially when I was writing The Ruins of Mars. So it's like a lot of that like optimistic sort of sci-fi crept into me as opposed to like where we are now with a lot of sci-fi, which is really like post-apocalyptic or dystopian. Mm -hmm. Um there was like a time where sci-fi authors were feeling super hopeful because they saw all this like potential for technology to like save humanity and, uh, and uplift us or lift us up, you know? Um, so I kind of wrote the ruins of Mars with a lot of that in it. Uh, so despite my age, I was kind of writing like an older dude. And so it really resonates with those readers and um, they're on Facebook. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, no disrespect to the boomers, but they are on Facebook, uh, you know, on law. Yes, they are true. there in large numbers. So a uh, little targeted advertising to to that group of folks with, you know, a few little keywords here and there uh, to help dial it in. And the Ruins of Mars trilogy just hums along um, for, you know, a few dollars a day. The newer books is where I'm like really hustling on TikTok uh, because they are geared towards like a younger audience. I mean, that's not to say that older audiences might not enjoy them, but you know, so it's kind of a mix of both. So when you were writing the ruins of Mars, um, that literally, were you targeting that older audience or no, is that no, like I was super surprised as you were making these sales? Yeah, like, Oh, Hey, 100%. This, mm -hmm. these guys are really picking up the story and liking it. I remember the day that I realized like, Oh my God, uh, there's a button here on Facebook metrics and it will tell you, you know, who's responding to your advertisements. Uh, you know, cause I was like totally wet behind the ears with all that um, marketing and stuff. Like I'm now I've been at it for like over 10 years. I'm kind of starting to get my head wrapped around it, but um, yeah, that was a total accident. I wrote that. I wrote that series, how I would want to read it, I guess, because I was reading all this Arthur C. Clarke, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, Asimov. And I was reading all this kind of like, bright and sunny, even though it has struggle and strife and stuff. So um, yeah, I had no idea. And and I think it's probably, a. it could be in my opinion, in, in my opinion, I'll, I'll preface it like that. It's a trap maybe to fall into writing for an audience specifically. Like it doesn't hurt to know your audience, but um, I, I guess I'm not one of these writers. I don't write enough books fast enough to be like chasing a specific audience and providing what it is they want in in the time frame they want it. Like I'm a I'm a little too much of a I'm a little too much of like I do my own thing a little too much, you know. And then I try to find out who might want it after the fact because the other way just doesn't work for me creatively. Well, and I don't think there's a problem with that. I see tons of advice. I've talked to a lot of people, marketers and coaches and whatnot, who say identify your audience prior to writing. I'm not that person. Mm. I, mm -hmm. I I haven't I still technically haven't identified my audience um, because, like I said, for me, creatively, it just doesn't work. I'm a pantser. Right. It's just how I that's how I run my life. It's how I run my writing. And so, you know, conversely, I was talking to another author um, and listening to another podcast where they there was an author talked about intuition. And there's such a uh -huh. thing as not only intuitive writing, but intuitive marketing, meaning hmm. you go into marketing, you, you don't really know. You, you've learned a lot of things from books. Maybe you don't know exactly how you want to market your books. You learn as you go and you just follow your intuition and you can still be equally as successful being an intuitive mm -hmm. marketer, an intuitive author as someone who pre-plans who their audience is and what they book their books want to be about and whatnot. So it works. That, that, and I mean, it's obviously more working like for you. Yeah. Yeah. That, 
that feels more like what I'm doing. Like I, I have a nose for things. Like I mean, when I wrote the Ruins Mars, uh, Curiosity was getting ready. The Curiosity rover was ready to be launched. It launched mm. shortly after the books came out. Andy Weir's The Martian was blowing up. I think the movie was about to come out. Like mm. Mars was on the brain, and it's always been on my brain because like that that uh, series is about like it's got a real ancient aliens through line mm -hmm. and i'm like an ancient aliens guy like so i've always wanted to do those types of stories and i remember getting obsessed with like the pyramids on mars i'm using air quotes for all the listeners out there uh and the face on mars again the air quotes um and i've been obsessed with that stuff since i was like a kid uh and so like i went out, out to write my story about you know it's in the title you know ruins on mars and then they're exploring them i was like this is going to be great people are going to love it and then also Mars seems to be everywhere right now. So it was a combination of things. It's like, I've always wanted to tell that story, but then like something inside me was like, this is the time for you to actually buckle down and write the book. You know, it was my first book. And as you know, writing one book, uh, I think there's probably a lot of ways it could go. But for me, it was like pretty fast and pretty uh, sloppy and, you know, it got done, but it, it, it certainly wasn't like a work of uh, art, <laughs> which is why it's funny when I have to go out there and, and hawk it. And I I don't like to open it and read it. <laughs> it makes me cringe a little bit because I've come a long way, but uh, this is what people want. So maybe it's not always about what I think and feel about my work, but, you know, that's that's the whole thing, right? That's the that's the mystery and the magic. I mean, there, there's so much to, to unpack there in terms of your perception of your own work. I'm the same way. I, I don't think I've reread my first book in a long long time but i think maybe i've read a couple of pages and i'm just thinking wow why did i write that mm. the way i did mm -hmm. you know i've mm -hmm. just come a long way i had mentioned i'm nearing a million words having you know i've written that much you just pick up things i've, I've read a lot of books and you learn from it yeah but but the same thing you know you can read your book and think hey this is scrappy this isn't the professional maybe as professional of a work as i would have liked at, but at the time it was right right at the time of your writing you... career it's what you knew yeah and I want to say it's successful, <laughs> right? I and mean, you're selling. It's successful. It's exactly. And this is something I have been kicking around in my head a lot lately. This idea that I think sometimes we as artists uh, and or creatives, I, I'll use a broader term, put on ourselves that we really shouldn't be allowed, there's those air quotes again, to present our work unless it is the most polished, completed, and perfect version of what we are able to produce, mm -hmm. um, which is in like almost impossible because we are growing as we write, you know, as we go, grow as we go. Um, each book I put out, I like, you know, each as I chip away at those million words, if I haven't hit them yet, you know, I'm, I'm, um, I'm refining my, my talent and getting better, but like, what a weird thing to put on myself that I don't think I should be able to go out and call myself an author or a writer until I feel that I've achieved whatever that uh, pinnacle of my talent is. It's like, no, no, no. People will support you along the way. You know, mm -hmm. they will watch you grow too through your work and it's okay to present that to them, even if it's not, you know, what you would think of as perfect, which is a trap because probably I'll never think I've reached my ultimate potential, you know? So it's sort of like reminding yourself to just like, all right, yes, the book I wrote 10 years ago when I was 20 something years old, uh, hmm, there's some interesting choices there. <laughs> a little subject object uh, confusion happens now and then, you know, some sentence structure I'm not super duper in love with, but like, you know, if that, that fucking book almost has a thousand reviews on Amazon. So I probably should shut up and just say, it's great and go read it and you'll love it. <laughs> Yep, absolutely. And it's, I think that's the outlook that you need to have. And like you mentioned, I don't know if there's any writer out there who feels 100% confident in all. I mean, I don't know, maybe I haven't talked to like Stephen King or Brandon Sanderson. Maybe they've mm. reached a point where they're like, hey, I know that I'm going to produce the perfect work that I love and I'm not going to have any problems with it. But it seems right. like the, the trend is the authors that I've talked to never really get that. Maybe they've published 30, 40, 50 books and they're okay with not being perfect. They've kind of reached this point where they're like, hey, it's not going to be perfect because that's just writing. That's just art. It's all cre it's a creative process, but it reaches mm -hmm. a point that's acceptable for my audience and for myself. And then you just put it out there and you don't look again. It reaches, it reaches a point when the imposter syndrome like <laughs> dies down yeah. to just like a simmer, just you a know, whisper. just, it's just <laughs> there, but it's not like, 
Yeah. It's not screaming in your ear or boiling over or anything. Mm -hmm. It's <laughs> yeah. I mean, I struggle with that still. And I recently went viral on TikTok for one of my videos, a book video promo um, for like this series of short stories that I've been writing lately that are doing super well, like crazy well, in part because I went viral on TikTok. But it's mm -hmm. like when that happened, uh, like and all the and I woke up and checked my phone the next morning and there was all these comments and there was all these, you know, um, there's all this engagement. I got like overwhelmed. I got mm -hmm. like this, like my, the kind of imposter syndrome or it's not, it's uh, everybody, this isn't even the best in the series. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, this video that I made for this one, like, I don't even think this one's like, it's, it's good. No, but, but there are others that are bad, but it's like, no, no, no. I just had to like tamp that down and just like, okay, woof, I've been at this for all these years and it still, it still hits me. Like you get, you feel like you get a little spotlight shown on you and you're like, yeah, it's just that tendency to want to only present the best thing that I feel like I have, which is usually the last thing I wrote, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's, that's interesting about people. And I don't mean this in a negative way, but when we're working with social media, when we're working with people, they're not going to go out of their way often to like delve into you and look at all your books. It's just because of the way the human mind works. They're going to look at what's on the surface. Like you said, right. the viral video about your short stories, that's what they picked up on. That's what they're looking at immediately. And some people might, you know, you've got those trickle through people. They're like, Hey, this is great. What other, what other things? I'll read. Guy, right? Yeah, exactly. But and they'll, they're, they'll dive they're into not. It. They're not the norm, though. They're, they're yeah, not, they're not the, the norm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, they're... <laughs> so you can't plan on that. That'd be so great if you could mm -hmm. plan on that. Be like, I'm going to create this great funnel or whatever you want to call it, this website and lead people through this experience. Most people just won't. And that's OK. Um, that's what marketing yeah. is. That's where that's where the backlist comes in. The more content you have out there, the more likely you are to get hits and draw those yeah, people in. Absolutely. And, and, you, just learn and that over you, time. you catch somebody like... I've really expanded in terms of what I write. Like I started out writing sci-fi mm -hmm. and then I, uh, as a film nerd, um, I, I thought when I finished the ruins of Mars series, I was like, okay, um, I, I want to, uh, move on to, I, I think I want to do like what my favorite directors do, which is, uh, climb new mountains, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to name drop, but I will like <laughs> people like Ridley Scott, Steven Spielberg, even like I'm, I'm mm -hmm. a blockbuster. I, I write like the one thing that connects all my stories is that they are, have a blockbuster vibe to them because sure. I was originally a filmmaker way back in the day. So I, um, you know, so these directors, you know, they, they pivot from project to project, world to world, genre to genre. There's always that thing that makes it distinctly theirs, but they're successful in that, uh, in that kind of dance. So I thought I'm going to try that too. And so the next book I wrote, now I would have now I now I call it urban fantasy. At the time, I didn't know what to call it. Um, the Man from Rome. I just thought it's going to be mythological. It's going to be set in Rome. I love Rome. It's going to be all this stuff. Uh, it's going to be action packed and all that. Um, it never really did find that audience, and I got a lot of people who bought it because they were avid readers of the Ruins of Mars. Because mm. that's a it's a it's a weirdly dedicated fan base. Like the not the norm trickle through from TikTok folks. Uh, there's a, a larger contingent of people that have read the ruins of Mars that do go through and read everything I wrote because they really like those books, which is great. And I love that. And I encourage that. And that's why I'm going to be writing another ruins of Mars book someday soon. But, um, when I did the man from Rome, they just were like, Oh, this isn't what we want at all. Like we want sci-fi. I want what you were doing before. And, um, that hit me kind of hard. And I was like, shit, do I, should I just like, should I just kind of go, even though my heart's not really in sci-fi anymore, should I pivot back to sci-fi and write more books sort of like that? And that was that m moment between like, am I a commercial bookseller or am I an artistic bookseller or am I trying to strike a better balance between the two? And, um, and then I thought of like, again, you know, Ridley Scott or um, Spielberg, you know, not every movie's a hit. And that was like, once I was like, okay, you know, I love these, I love this idea of trying to climb new mountains, all that stuff, but understanding that's okay when not every one of them is a hit, you just move on. You know, back in the day, they used to be like, oh, hey, we're going to make a whole uh, franchise out of this movie. Oh, everyone hates it. Never mind. Franchise canceled. Moving on. You know, and that was that. It wasn't like the end of the world and it didn't like tarnish their reputation necessarily. It's like you took a swing. All right. So I just started to think about the man from Rome as you took a swing. 
and moved on with my life. And then, oh my God, I'm finding out all these lessons I learned writing in that book is coming to bear on other projects. And it's like, okay, it was worth it in the end, uh, even if it didn't kind of like blow up how I, I was hoping or didn't meet my expectations. But it's like, you know, you just I just had to approach it in that way of like, all right, that franchise didn't work out. On to the next one. Maybe that'll work out, you know, and we'll see. Well, I think it's important to understand that, you know, people who are listening, you, there's there's varying levels of advice that you hear from authors. You might hear from some authors saying staying within the same genre is beneficial for someone because people know what you're writing. They expect that from you and you can right. sell more effectively because you're writing just the same thing. And then you've got other authors like you that are like, yeah, but my heart might not be in that genre all the time. You know, I want yes. to dabble in other things. There's various ways to do that. You can do different pen names, but that has its own can of worms. You know, that mm -hmm. you, you know, I've, I've talked to people with different pen names and managing those two separate businesses can be tricky. But I think what you mentioned at the end of the day is recognizing where you are as an author, what works for you, where your passion lies, and then working with it. Right. I don't think there's enough people that talk about working with what you have rather than, you know, there's just a lot of change this, change this, change your mentality, which I think there's yeah. there's always a place for that. There always is. But I think there's something to be said about someone who's authentic in the way they want to write in what they want to write. And then you may it may take a little bit longer to find your audience. But once your audience understands you you know, there's a lot of crossovers, you know, there might be some people, you may have even found them that, that read the sci-fi series and then read your book, The Man from Rome and thought, oh, this is really cool. It's different. It's not what I expected, yeah. but I loved it. Yeah, there are, and they're out there and I, and it happens. And like that book has since gone on to kind of carve out its little nation. That's great. But it's true what you say, because, you know, there is something to discipline. Mm -hmm. um, and so you could consider, the notion that okay um stick to a pick a genre stick to it um because that's how your readers will know you and they'll discover one book and another and another and another and in a in a way that that's a form that's a that's a form of discipline at mm -hmm. least to me it is right. because it would take a lot of discipline from me to hold my mind always in one genre right uh but that's that's not how i personally approach writing because that's just stifling to me and yeah. at the uh, i was having a conversation that kind of relates to this the other day with a, a really bookish friend of mine connor i love you man uh he and i have gone around and around he's an he is i don't want to put words in his mouth but you know what he said him so here they go uh he's <laughs> really he's an he's an a writer's writer he writes literature he likes mm -hmm. literature he writes poetry he believes in arts for art's sake. Um, and he was actually, uh, he actually is a, is, a, is a publisher. He has a boutique publishing uh, business called Winter Texts. So if you like boutique oh. publishers with really cool aesthetics, go there, check out his books. And he published one of my books, a novel, my fifth novel. Um, and that's how we kind of became acquainted. But we always had this back and forth because he was very like uh, art for art's sake. And I was like, yes, but I would also like to get it some money too because i put a lot of time into this and effort um and even though it came from a, a spot a place of inspiration within me it still was work and i would like to be paid for that work and i think there are people who would like to pay me for it it was kind of more important anyway we got into a conversation so we usually kind of come at, the, at that we usually come to conversations from those two sides of things um and we were talking about chat gpt and how there's now folks out there writing books using it mm -hmm. um and i i said something to the effect of like uh you know how can i compete with that and he went on his um because i don't produce fast enough it's just not something i can do um and he went on, kind of on his art for art's sake and it made me realize that he he is right not 100 percent, but i will concede he's right enough because when i get inspired um, which I get inspired. That's why I write. I don't want to go to a website and type in prompts. I want to produce the thing that inspired me, that, mm -hmm. that thing that flashed into my head. If it's listening to a song and suddenly there's a scene, how, how do I relay that to a computer? It's easier if I just do it, you know, mm -hmm. and it feels, it feels good. So like, you know, I write because it feels good ultimately. And I'm lucky enough that um, people have 
demonstrated that they want to read at least enough of what I write that I can get by doing it. Well, I think there's a lot to to go off there. And I've heard a lot about ChatGPT. I know there's a lot of people that use it. I have logged in approximately for 10 seconds. <laughs> yeah. And I think I asked it for a sales description for one of my books. Mm. And I don't even remember. I don't even think I used anything from it. It was just interesting. But I know yeah, that there's, you know, I think there's, I have no problem with ChatGPT. I'm, I'm not personally concerned about the competition from the books that it might produce or partial books that it might produce. But I'm like you. I know myself, authentic writing myself. I know that that's just not going to be helpful for me. I'm the type of person who I can't even outline my story because then I don't want to write it because then I already know what happens. Like for me, the discovery part of it is the fun part. Mm -hmm. It's I want to write the book because I don't know what's going to happen. That's why Mm -hmm. editing's hard for me personally. I don't want to, the book's done. I don't want to edit it because I've already read it, right? I do edit. I do it because it's it's a necessary evil for me. But that's part of the reason I don't plot. Now I don't want a computer to tell me, you know, ideas of what to do yeah. because I want to come up with that on my own. I know. So right. it's just same. It's I I like to solve the puzzle. Yeah. For um, sure. I, and and it's fun to think in a weird way, um that like you're sometimes I feel like I'm approaching writing from two different minds and they're not always communicating mm, okay. um, in, in the way that like I will, um, I, I have a loose idea of where I have, a, a, I have ideas. I've scenes that come to me in the early stages of writing and, and, and through the whole first draft process and sometimes into later drafts, which creates problems. But these scenes come to me and it's up to me to figure out where they fall in the sequence of events uh, that would make the story in the timeline um, and so I sort of, I think of them as mile markers, whatever, everybody's got different names for these things. And so I sort of build towards and away from, and that's how I try to tell myself mm. the story. Um, but uh, there's, it's it's like I said, it's like sometimes I'm approaching things from two minds, like I'll be writing and I'm writing along and then I have to stop for a while because I have to figure out how to solve this problem, puzzle that I've made for myself. I made it. And yet the answer is not immediately apparent. It takes some time to ruminate on or explore. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to say something that's like, I, I you know, I, I know there are authors out there. You might be one as well. Um, and so no, I mean, no disrespect if you're listening and this is you, but I don't necessarily feel as though my characters are like these people that live in my head and they talk to me and they surprise me and I call them by name. They're, they're extensions of my creativity. They're tools they're necessary for telling a story. They are necessary for engaging with human beings because this is how we operate and communicate. They're not like alive inside me. So they don't like speak to me and whisper like, oh, this is what you'll do to fix the problem. I have to <laughs> fucking sit there and think about this thing. Like it's a puzzle and I have to move different pieces around. And at least I get to create the new piece, which is crazy because I created all the old pieces too. If I wanted, I could go, you know, but that's just not how I, so it seems sometimes like I'm coming to it from two different minds. I'm opening up a box. It's full of puzzle pieces. And then I get to build some new pieces here and there and put them together. And and yet it's all just coming from the same uh, source, which is me. It's a weird thing. It's like, I should put a couple of, I should put like by Dylan Quarles and Dylan Quarles with contributions from <laughs> Dylan Quarles. <laughs> Uh, it sounds like you and I are very similar. The, the characters aren't alive in my head. There's no whispers. I don't. I don't. Yeah. They're not real people in my head. It's just an extension of my creation. I'm the same way. I tell people, you know, my writing process is. I, I didn't realize that it's kind of strange. I'm I'm currently co-authoring a trilogy mm. with someone. Wow. Fascinating experience. I could get into what that's like. It's so interesting. <laughs> Her writing uh, process is vastly different from mine, and it's fine. You yeah. know, we're working together just fine. The but she's a writer, is- right? Yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. Um, I, I'm, I've co authored a book with a not writer. Oh, really? We, oh, yeah, about, she's, we could talk about that. And she's a writer. Yeah, she's written, I want to say, it's about the same amount of books as me, roughly. Mm. Um, we started about the same time. But anyway, our processes are so differently. I, the way I look at my books is I write the book like I'm reading it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that just works for me. So, uh, the, 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 the difference is she writes like die, a lot of dialogue bare bones descriptions and then fleshes it out later i write it fully fleshed yes i I spare no details i write it as if i'm reading it for the first time the way i'd like to read the book and i think Uh, that lends to why my books are longer i tried i've tried so hard to write shorter books it's like i want to be her i want to do what she does and i try to tell myself that 
but I, I have to, I have to sit there and like sweat over a sentence, like a descriptive sentence at the beginning of a paragraph in a first draft, mm. because I want to set the scene for who, for me, mm -hmm. you know, it, I can't just uh, trust that future me will get the feeling I have right now right. in this moment that I think is important for this scene. Exactly. And so I end up, and yet sometimes when I hit editing, I, unlike you, I do love editing. I really like turd polishing. It's my favorite oh, uh, my thing God. to do because <laughs> I get to feel like I'm reading the story. And then whenever there's a moment when I'm like, oh, I wish I could do that, but I wish I could kind of take another crack at that. Oh, I, I can, I'm going to you know, and then kind of do that. But um, yeah, it's, it is a whole thing. Uh, kudos to you for, for working with an author, another author, another writer, I should say, and, and sounding um, happy about it. Oh, it's, it's my fun. experience. It's different. Is, is not, it's, I wouldn't do it again. Uh, at I've least just, this way. I've just warned her the experience. It's like, look, I'm just going to warn you now, this is how I operate. And I will, I can modify my process if, if you need me to, but just, I'm so <laughs> the warning that I gave was I can't guarantee what my, my brain is going to do to this story because it comes <laughs> to me as I go, you know, it's just like revealed to me as I go. Um, and so, you know, we tried to make rough plans about what the books are going to be about. And I've already gone off the cuff. I'm just like, sorry, like, you're just going to have to work with me. And she's like, I actually love it because I just don't know what to expect. So when I read one of your chapters, it's like I had never even considered going that way. And so she just oh, goes cool. off of it. And then I read her stuff and I go off and it. Yeah, and so a lot of things have happened that we didn't plan on, but that's how I write my books. I mean, I started right. my trilogy is a little bit strange and people still don't believe me that I didn't plan any of it. Um you know, I, I leave breadcrumbs just naturally in the first book. I got to the third book and I had no idea what the ending was. I'm like, I have right. no idea how I'm going to end this series, but Same. it's going to end. And I know it's mm -hmm. going to end. Um, it took about 170,000 words in that wow, book for it to lot. end. It tells yeah. you my books are big. But that's when I got to the, one. actually, I think that one was 189. That was almost 190,000. But yeah. when I got to the end, it just wrapped up neatly. And it tied back to things in the first book that I still hadn't solved. I was like, oh, sure. interesting. That, that worked uh, when out. When I dropped that in the first book, I had no idea that's where it was leading. And people were like, there's no way that you didn't plan that. I was like, I didn't. I uh, <laughs> just, I, just kind of came out. It's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, it's, but that's that two minds, I think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's some part of you that was always keeping right. track a little bit, you know, like and it was, in, you know, yeah, and it, maybe it wasn't like some cute, like one of your characters in a dream, like I fucking hear people say, sorry if this is a family show. I see people write these things, authors, and it just makes, it's very cringy in my opinion. But if you're one of these authors, please don't take offense. But you know, oh, my character came to me in a dream and told me how the story should go. No, sir. No, 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 no. You it told yourself. To me, but it's, yeah. it's a cool process. It's cool. It, lean into the magic, whatever. It's neat. I like the story too. I'm a storyteller. Maybe that's why I'm skeptical, but uh, it's like with the similar thing that happened to me with my first trilogy of starting out. Okay. I, I have an idea for a story about astronauts going to Mars because ruins are discovered on Mars and they mm -hmm. want to explore them. And then some stuff happens and then they have to escape kind of uh, cataclysmic events. And I sat down and I started writing the first book and I was like, you know, all these things are coming up like, well, it's sci-fi. So I kind of have to say like how they're getting there. I got to talk about mm -hmm. the ship and it being built. And there has to be the, there always has to be the like round table meeting where they're going to like lay out how some of this shit works. Um, exposition, but in a way that feels like you'd have it in a movie, you know, like we're going to have the board meeting, like, oh, call Bruce Willis and the boys because the asteroids are coming or whatever, you know, like started to do all these things things and before i knew it the first book was like a book and i had barely gotten to mars and i had not begun to explore the ruins of the titular ruins of mars uh so i was like okay i guess this is two books and then it, it just like as things began to logically logically illogically for the sake of the story however you want to look at it as things began to unfold as they did naturally it just kept going and going until i was to the point in the third book where i was like i honestly like you're saying, don't know how this is all going to end, how this is all going to tie together. But I feel that it needs to so that it has meaning because I'm I'm knocking on the door of, of uh, I was knocking on a philosophical door all throughout that series. And so you kind of can't do that if you're not going to like 
tie it all together and say there was a message here or there's something to be taken away. So the trick for me, that whole puzzle process for me in the third book came to be, okay, how do I tie everything together in a way that feels good, but also feels like the other two books where things are happening because in spite of, therefore, however, you know, it wasn't just, and then, and then, and then, and then it mm-hmm. was a story was unfolding informed by the events that were, had happened before it, uh, you know, so that it felt like it was unfolding in a way that was natural. So I had to both do that with the third book, but also make sure I'm tying everything up. And weirdly enough, uh, it kind of was a lot less difficult than I thought it was going to be. And I think that's that subconscious was mm-hmm. keeping track, you know, uh, so that it, the process ended up being feeling less forced, you know, than some some stuff I've read and some stuff I've seen where it's like, oh, okay, like they got a note from the editor and it's uh, and the editor's making the wrap it up sign and they maybe are not that kind of writer, they're mm-hmm. not that kind of thinker. So I kind of lucked out there that it turned out it's like, okay, I'm a I can juggle a lot of shit I think here. Uh, but it's like learning as you go, you know, you don't know that about now. I know that about myself, but I didn't then it's like, well, I'm like knee deep in this saga. And there are people who are like waiting for the next book. And mm-hmm. what if I don't know how to finish it? You know? Yep. It's, I mean, it sounds like it's, it's validated and here you experience a similar thing because I was also extremely nervous to write the third book because I don't take notes. You know, that's part of my pants or brain. I'm not great at taking notes. It's just not the way I flow. I remember Same. most details relatively well. Um, you know, people are baffled when I tell them, like, if I have a story idea while I'm just walking around doing dishes, changing a diaper, you know, doing life things but then I don't remember it when I get to my writing session. To me, that means it's not meant to be in the book. And people sure. just don't, they can't swallow that. But for me, I'm fine. Like, I don't care. Like, I've had yeah. hundreds of ideas that didn't make it into my books because I, I figure if I don't remember them, they're not meant to go in. Um, and, no, but, I mean, you're speaking, you are like literally speaking my language right now, yeah. <laughs> my friend. Like, it's, it's, in, it's uncanny, you know, how it's, I have the same thing also while changing diapers. But yeah. like, yeah, like just things flicker into my head all day. And and, I, and I've talked to other writers who, you know, carry a little notepad with them everywhere mm-hmm. they go or have one by their bedside table so they can wake up in the middle of the night and write down their dreams. I've heard of, you know, super successful authors that do that too. Mm. Uh, I've had ideas in the middle of the night and I've been like, uh, oh, I'll remember that tomorrow. That's a good one. Mm-hmm. And then I do. Or I've been like, you know, midway into my day, the next day, I'm like, oh, wait, didn't I have an idea for something to do? Ah, whatever. I'm going in yeah. this direction now. You know, <laughs> exactly. just... It's like, man, I'm not, to... I've just learned not to worry about it. And I think that, mm-hmm. and that's why I was pleasantly surprised when I read, wrote the third book. Now, is it perfect? I don't know. I don't think anything's perfect, but I felt like even my editor was like, I was wildly impressed with how you tied everything together, having yeah. not written anything down. And I was like, I'm wildly impressed with yeah. my brain because I didn't think that it was even possible. And I've but heard a lot it, now of people you know struggle. Now I know it's possible. And so I think it's yeah. just confidence in yourself, in your writing yeah. process, and not right. trying to fit yourself into some box if you recognize that, that box is not for you. For me, it, plot, it, this plotting is, tough, is not me. Right. And I... It's a tough thing though with writers because the, like a lot of people, uh, you're lucky and I think I'm lucky too. Um, a lot of people, it's not as clear for them who they are as writers yeah, or how it is that they write. Um, and because, you know, the world is full and I've run them of workshops, which are trying mm-hmm. to help people write a story. Um, the good workshops are trying to help them unlock their own process. Mm -hmm. Um, not coach them through, you know, tried and true 10 steps to writing a best-selling book, whatever, like maybe those do work. I don't, I don't know, but I would feel very insincere for me to say that to somebody participating in a workshop that I was running, that this will work for you and you will write a best-selling book in 10 steps, whatever, like a lot, but there are folks out there who know they want to write. They feel that they have a story to tell. And they, they, they think about it. They see it in their heads. Maybe they wake up in the middle of the night. Maybe they carry that notepad around with them and they write all these amazing ideas down. But they just don't yet know how it is that they make that a reality. And it's like where the rubber meets the road, you know? Like if you if you don't know how you're right, how you write, 
you're going to spend a lot of time beating your head against um, a keyboard. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just tell writers in that position, um, because when I have had them come to me, friends and people in these workshops, you know, just be kind to yourself because like being mean, being hard on yourself is not going to help any of that. And it just makes me feel fortunate every time I hear it or I hear a story like yours it makes it kind of just like okay there are we're out there people that are just like <laughs> there's more i don't know man i just wanted to go for it and it just started going and uh it kept, once it got momentum then i just had i had to hold on and make sure it's kept momentum you know and that's literally what happened with my my first book start I w- i've been wanting to write a book my entire life I never have because i've just been too scared i'm not eloquent with my words i don't feel like i know i don't have a huge vocabulary right i don't feel like i can write very effectively and a friend at work when i was i think i was 28 when i started writing 28 or 29 mm-hmm. she just said i'll just try it just sit down and write something i was like i don't have any ideas she was like just write and i sat down and i just wrote it was like 3000 words random mm-hmm. story and it turned into a trilogy yeah. just like i was like well i'm just going to run with this and it became yeah. you know an epic trilogy and now it's just life, you know, I just get random sentences, starter sentences, and it becomes yeah. a book. You right. know? Isn't that interesting when it stops so being weird. an idea and it's, and instead an idea comes to you as a crafted uh, mm-hmm. paragraph that it contains the idea in it. For me, it was, I saw things like a movie because I was in that filmmaker yeah. mind and I still, I still do from time to time see things, but like I would see something and then I'd have to figure out how to write it. A lot of times now it's like, maybe it's happening so quick. It feels that it's one, it's simultaneous, but I sort of see the thing and I hear the way that sentence or paragraph or collection of sentences will, uh, in my voice, convey what it is that I'm seeing, um, which is a weird moment when that shifts. And I think that's probably just part of that million words, 10,000 hours, whatever. That's part of just like doing a thing over and over and over and over again. You're yeah. conditioning your mind, how, how to, how to work in that. Um, when I started writing, the, you made me think uh, of it when you're talking about writing your, your first book and how you just t- sort of sat down. Somebody said, just, just do it. Just, I, uh, I used to, when I got out of college and I was no longer in an environment where um I was surrounded by other creatives who wanted to take part in these creative projects like filmmaking really requires a village, you know, and, or a large team. Um, I was like, well, I don't know what to do with myself because I'm like this storyteller visual dude and I don't have actors and makeup and people who want to figure out special effects around me anymore. I'm on my own. And um, so what I would do was I had this, this coworker at the time. He's my one of my oldest and best friends. And we just happened to work together for a while. And it was kind of a menial job. Uh, it was like facilities maintenance. And um, we were driving around in the maintenance truck one day. And we were, it was boring. It was a boring day, a slow day. And we just sort of started like, I, I told him like this idea, you know, like what, because we used to do this a lot as kids, what if? And then we would go into our own, we'd tell each other stories kind of, and it would be like a game. So I started just tell him, you know, the Ruins Mars story as it existed in my head. And he was really good at, he is, continues to be really good at punching holes in everything I do and mm. everything I say. Um, so he really challenges me to, uh, he's always challenged me uh, in that way. So we, I just, we just start sort of at the time, now I would call it workshopping. Back then I just, it was filling hours, you know, Um in a boring day in the summer, I went home. My wife and her friend were there. Uh, I live in Washington State, and this I hope is beyond the statute of limitations. But I smoked up some weed, and I started going, "Hey, you guys want to hear this like crazy idea I had?" And I was talking about it with, with my friend and 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 talking about it with Cougar, and we went through it. And you guys want to hear it? And they were like, "Sure, dude." They're used to me like kind of doing stuff like that. And I just told them <laughs> this story as like Pandora was on in the background and playing like epic music. And at the end, my wife's friend was like, "Dude, you need to write that down." And and it was like the really moment, like for for real. And so then I just I said fuck it. I'll try. We'll see what happens. And I wrote that thing on like Google docs, you know, like Mm -hmm. not in a format that resembles a novel and an editor had to do a lot of work. Andrew, I'm sorry. Uh, He had to do a lot of work just to get that book formatted like a book because I just was like, well, all righty. And I'm just going to 
go for it and see what happens. And then, you know, I fell in love with how that process works. And now all these 10 plus and years here later, are. here I am talking right. to you Being about writing. I mean, yeah, I think, sort of. I think it's safe. There, there, there's so much to be said about writing. And if, if anything, you draw anything from this, it's uh, give yourself time for one to, to learn. You know, if you're new, don't try not to feel frustrated because it's just it takes a little bit of time to learn. And two, don't feel obligated to force yourself into something if it just doesn't feel right. You know, right. I've heard both sides. If you are someone who plans everything in life and someone says you should pants your way because it works for me and it's just some work for you. Don't don't make up. Don't pants your books, you know, plan your books. That's great. And the vice versa. Right. I've heard of a lot of people who feel like they have to plot because there's things like save the cat, you know, all these plotting mm -hmm. specific books. And just yeah. because that's what X person says works for them doesn't mean it's going to work right. for you. And it's OK that it doesn't work for you. And you're probably totally going to know. It's okay if it doesn't work for you in terms of like the process. If you're alive and breathing air in the year 2023 and want to tell a story, you know a lot about stories already, even yep. if you don't know you do. Because you've been Absolutely. watching movies and television, you've been reading books, mm -hmm. listening to audiobooks, listening to bedtime stories, folklore, myth, mythology, all of it your whole life. You've been soaking it in. And so like when people get really lost in the weeds with like, what specifically needs to happen in a story at what specific time. It's like, yeah, sure, totally. But there are also stories that have endured since like time immemorial that don't really follow mm -hmm. the hero's journey or the three act structure or whatever. Like some, like the Iliad starts in the middle and it ends mm -hmm. before the Trojan horse. A lot of people forget that, you know, it's like, and yet it's been around for thousands of years. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, these things are important to an extent, but you probably already know it. It's probably already inside you. And that's like that, that, that intuitive thing you were talking about. Like, yep. you know, I, I trust that I understand what makes a story effective because I watch, you know, a movie and I'm like, it's trash. It didn't, it's not for me. It's not effective story mm -hmm. in my opinion, or I watch a movie or a television show and I go, fuck, that was awesome. God, what a great script. What a great story. All oh, the dialogue, you know, and I soak that up and I just soak it up like a sponge yep. and everybody's doing that. Yep, absolutely. And that I've heard a lot of that. You, you're training your algorithm, your brain, your learning model with stories constantly. And so mm -hmm. that's where a lot of that intuition comes in and trusting that is a big piece of it. But for real. Uh, we could probably talk about this for hours. There's so much that we <laughs> just because we are running short <laughs> on true. time, though. So before we, we end here, uh, where can people find more information about you and your books if they want to check them out? Well, you can find me on Amazon. Uh, it's Dylan James Quarles. Uh, you can find me on Facebook, uh, same name there, and uh, Instagram, of course. And TikTok is where things are really going down. I think it's kind of fun to check me out on TikTok if you have it, because um, you get like a little bit more sense for the aesthetic of the books in a weird way, because I'm controlling the page. Yeah, I'm putting my w kind of spin on these. Um, on these videos and they're so much more personalized in that way uh, but you can find me there at author dylan james quarles and uh, we're having a lot of fun on the socials so yeah check me out i also have a website <laughs> i always forget about that thing <laughs> the last thing DJ you mentioned <laughs> djqfiction.com that's the easy <laughs> one to remember and awesome. this will be on there uh, when it goes live i'll yeah, put it up no. on my uh, social media section all the show notes and everything will be there too so all your links will be clickable It'll be pretty right easy for you to access them. But thank you so much for your time. This has been great. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I hope you found that as helpful as I did. It's really insightful and encouraging to hear from other indie authors about their success stories. It's not just about having content. If it was just about writing the book and publishing it, then I think a lot more people would be successful. It's about marketing, finding your audience, knowing that audience, and marketing to them which I know is a challenging thing for everybody. Next week, we are talking to H. Walsh about his experience as an author with dyslexia. So it's a really interesting conversation and helpful for those of us who may be experiencing similar symptoms or sim similar challenges from a disability perspective with our writing. It get, he's very positive about his approach to writing, and I think you'll really enjoy his insights in that conversation. As usual, if you have questions for me, feel free to contact me on any of the social media platforms, author Dan Kenner, you can find me everywhere, or you can submit a form at dankenner.com. If you have friends, authors, cover artists, lawyers, anybody who is interested in being the podcast, 
definitely let me know, or you can head to dankenner.com slash podcast and fill out the form there. Feel free to comment about your thoughts on each of the videos on YouTube. If you have any comments or questions, feel free to put them up there. I love to make this a conversation. I hope you have a great day. Talk to you next week.